Okay. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Hi, everyone. So, welcome to our May um, 2022 um, First Tuesday Luncheon. We are glad that you are all here. I am Hilburn Michael, your 2022 GRRA president, and I think we're all glad to be out today. The weather is finally, um, we've got some sunshine, it's getting a little warmer, so spring is upon us. Um, so we are excited about that. We have a great program today. We've got some wonderful guest speakers. Um, the Reverend Dr. Frank Thomas from Mount Zion Baptist Church in High Point um, is going to speak to us as well as Winston McGregor um, over here at this table, president of the Guilford Educational Alliance and the Guilford County Board of Education at large uh, member and vice chair. Um, I wanted to tell you all that Mike and I and a few other members of um, the Board of Directors just got back from Washington, D.C. for the NAR legislative meetings. Um, it was a fabulous um, five days. We learned a lot about um, what we are doing as realtors to protect the private property rights of um, homeowners and um, protect our industry. So it was very eye-opening. Um, one topic that was front and center all week was antitrust. And I know that you all hear about antitrust. Hopefully you're talking about antitrust in your offices. Um, if you have not seen the video that is on the NAR website, um, I would recommend you um, watch it. Um, share it with others in your office. It's a three-minute video. Um, that video reminds us that as realtors, we are not allowed um, to talk about um, commissions with other agents. Um, we're not. We're supposed to... Um, promote competition um, amongst others. Um, when we are talking to our clients, um, we are encouraged to talk about commissions, um, talk about how we're paid, talk about the different um, structures uh, that are out there with different firms. Um, we are not allowed to tell our buyers that our services are free because technically they, they really are not. We, we are definitely getting paid. Um, also very important to remember that online, um, some of our social media, um, we don't ever talk about um, commissions. Don't ever um, dip your toe even into anything that would um, suggest um, something that might um, trigger antitrust. So just a good reminder to know um, if anybody has any questions or would like um, to talk further about that, feel free to talk to me or any of our board members. Um, we would be happy to um, discuss it further. So usually, um, for those of you who come to the luncheons, um, you know that this is the time where we share cares and concerns, and I am thankful and grateful, and I cannot remember the last time this happened, that we have not had um, a death amongst our realtor family since last month. So thank you. We, we are very, um, we're just very, very happy about that. Um, so I hope that everyone is staying safe out there and um, taking care of your families and taking care of each other. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers um, for today. I'm going to read their bios. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about Reverend Dr. Frank Thomas. Would, <laughs> we, we, look, here, here we go. Yeah, here, here we go. Yeah. We've, we've got the highlights. Um, so um, Reverend Thomas is a native of Detroit, Michigan. Um, immediately after graduating from high school, he joined the U.S. Armed Services, where he served as a combat engineer for 25 years, ending his career as the senior military science instructor at Wake Forest University. Dr. Thomas is currently a pastor with Mount Zion Baptist Church, and he currently serves with the High Point Chamber of Commerce Advisory Board of Education. Uh, he was the 2019-2020 chair. Uh, he is on the Business High Point Foundation, United Way of Greater High Point. Um, in 2018, he was the campaign chair, and he serves on the Board of Visitors at High Point University. Uh, he's on the Board of Directors of American Heroes of North Carolina. In addition, he serves on the Board of Trustees for Foundation for a Healthy High Point and High Point Medical Center. 
Um, Reverend Thomas and his wife have three daughters, Alicia, Tiffany, and Crystal, and are the proud grandparents to three granddaughters. It's a lot of girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah strength, strength to you. And his, his granddaughters are Autumn, Zuri, and Amari. Did I say that right? Yes, so that's, that is wonderful. Um, and Winston McGregor um, currently serves as president of the Guilford Educational Alliance and as the vice chair of the Guilford County Board of Education. Previously, she served as president of Habitat for Humanity Greater Greensboro as director of development for the Democratic Leadership Council in Washington, D.C., and as an aide to Senator and Vice President Al Gore. Winston served on the board of NCCJ, an organization building communities free of bias, bigotry, and race. A North Carolina native, she has lived in Texas, Tennessee, Virginia, Argentina, and Washington, D.C., um, Winston holds a BA in International Studies from American University. And she has two young adult sons who currently attend Appalachian State University and NC State University. Yay! Okay. Well, yeah. Round of applause. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, that, that is great. So we are pleased that you are both here today. And so we'll start with um, Reverend. Thank you, and I hope, hope y'all don't mind if I don't use the podium. I use those on Sunday, so I'm not going to use them today. Um, it's great to be with you today. Um, I am the co-chair of the Smart Bomb campaign. I co-chair the campaign with someone who you probably know, Cecilia Thompson, from actually at Focus. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are they watching, though, too? So let me stay here, then. Let me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Preacher at a podium. A preacher at a podium. How much time do I have? <laughs> um, but as I was saying, I'm the co-chair of the Smart Bond campaign. Um, I co-chair the campaign with Cecilia Thompson from Action Greensboro. She was actually scheduled to be here today, but she's home with COVID. Um, so she texted me yesterday and asked me if I could fill in. It's pretty interesting because when we um, were scheduled for the High Point Realtors, I couldn't be there and she filled in for me. Um, so, and actually, um, Winston is actually just here as moral support. And I'll just um, tell you, this is the first time in several months uh, we've been running this campaign. This is the first time that I've done this presentation where I've had a school board member and a county commissioner in the room. So all those questions that I normally get that I can tell people, well, that's a commissioner question or that's a school board question, I have the answers here today. So we're thankful um, that um, I'm thankful that I'm able to be here with you today to share about a very critical and important topic in our community and what will be on the ballot, what has been on the ballot and what will be voters will decide on May 17th. How did we get to SMART? Several years ago, I believe 2019, the school board and the county commissioners um, directed a study of our schools and a company came in, an independent company, and did an assessment of every school in the district. And from that study came the facilities master plan. And many of you may know um, Marlene Sanford, Marlene and some other folks, um, Winston from GEA, um, rallied a group of business leaders. And from those meetings, um, we became the Invest in GCS committee. When we decided, when the county commissioners or when we started lobbying to the commissioners um, to put the bond on the campaign in 2020, we had to figure out what we were going to call the campaign. So we landed on the SMART campaign because we knew that no matter what the commissioners did, we would have to do subsequent campaigns. And we thought that the SMART campaign would translate no matter what time of year or what the climate, political climate is. So what is SMART? SMART is an acronym that stands for safe or secure, modern, accessible, renovated, and tech-ready schools. 
When we thought of this back in 2019, we thought, who could argue with this? And we have found through the 2020 campaign and in this campaign that there are people, unfortunately, unknowing, I don't know what the unword is for them, but they, 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 they are against safe schools. They are against modern schools, accessible schools, renovated schools, tech-ready schools. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out why. But that is our campaign, and that's what we landed on, and that's what we have gone with. And you've probably seen our signs. Unfortunately, I didn't bring any signs today, but you can pick them up at Action Greensboro. We have plenty of signs. Winston passed out um, our handouts that we're passing out at the polls. I have, we have stickers. We have all kinds of swag, if you will, um, if you'd like to share. But that's what SMART stands for. Safe, modern, accessible, renovated, and tech-ready schools. So what will be on the ballot? Um, and actually, this is in reverse order. I've seen a, a sample ballot, and actually the sales tax is first. So I'll go there first. There is a quarter of a cent or 0.25%, a fraction of a penny sales tax increase on the ballot. If passed, our sales tax will go from 6.75 to 7%. And that will be in keeping with just about everybody else in this area. Um, Guilford County is lagging a little bit on sales tax. And that will not... Um, go to groceries, prescription drugs, vehicles, and gas. <laughs> gas prices are high enough, <laughs> right? Um, and the other thing on the ballot will be the $1.7 billion bond referendum for capital needs for our schools. The facilities master plan, when it was published, it came in at a $2 billion price tag. The school board voted and, recommend, and requested of the county commissioners that they put a $1.6 billion bond package on the 2020 ballot. Our group met with board leadership and thought that $900 million would be a good place to land if, billion, if the B word was too much for voters. $2 billion price tag, $1.6 billion ask $900 million concession, $300 million bond. Does that resonate with anybody? Anybody do the quick math? Um, that's pretty low. Uh, and here is what the $300 million that was passed by 73% of voters in 2020 is already at work. Um, we've hired and secured the services of C2 High Caps as the project manager. Um, some land has already been identified and some contracts, I believe, have already are already in the works to acquire some land for new schools. And there have been some conceptual designs already done for what new schools might look like. Here's one in particular. This is a conceptual design of what the Hampton Peeler School might look like. It will be a K-5 visual and performing arts school. When this school is done, if you notice right underneath this white, this blue awning, um, you see the word joy on the side of the building. As the sun rises and the children arrive at school every day, the, the words art is joy will be projected on the side of the building. This is a projection. This is a conceptual design of what a modern school, the Hampton Peeler School, might look like. Here's what the inside could look like. On the left is a staircase, not the traditional staircase. On the far left side of that staircase, you see a child either walking up or down, but the rest of that staircase will be used kind of like an amphitheater where children will be able to sit on the stairs. They can do performances. They can do uh, lecture type things. Teachers can have multiple classes at one time in those spaces. And on the right side is a depiction of what the open spaces might look like. 
Um, these open spaces, there's an overlook where teachers <laughs> might stand up there rather than with the children just to look down on them and, and, and see what they are, should, and shouldn't be doing. Um, those small cubicles are spaces that even though it's a common space, teachers can have one-on-one -on -one or small group um, discussions or learning in those spaces. Again, this is a conceptual design of what the Hampton Peeler School might look like, and it's already um, moving. These are the projects that have been identified to be done with the $300 million bond that's been already approved. I want to answer a question that has been asked of me many times, or, or I've read about in the paper, well, they're not spending the $300 million that we authorized back in 2020. They've only spent $25 million or they've only spent $100 million. Well, of course, we're not going to issue bonds until we have projects ready to pay. Why would we issue bonds and start paying interest with money just sitting there waiting? From what I understand, I just talked to Commissioner Austin, we've issued about $120 million so far for 2020. And in 2023, there's a plan to issue the rest of the 180. So these are the projects that are underway with the 300 million that was already approved. And um, when I do this presentation in High Point, I always get the question, what about High Point schools? There's only one High Point school on this list. And I thought this is a Greensboro Association. I know some of you might have some dealings with some properties in High Point. And it's important to know and understand that the reason why is because these are the number of projects that could be done with the $300 million. And the way the facilities master plan rolled out is those each school got a grade each school was um and placed in order of priority of need and there is no changing the priority of need we can't get to lmnop until we finish with abc in priority so that's what's happening with the 300 million we're just going right down the line of when we finish that one and we have enough money, we'll go to the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, the next High Point school, I believe, is Allen J. And it would not start until the $306 million point. So had the $1.6 billion bond or even the $900 million, if the $1.6 gotten on the ballot and been approved, there would be eight more high point schools added to this list as well. So that's what I share with people when they ask about the high point schools. And oh, by the way, with that, oh, I don't, let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I know this presentation, so I'm trying to go to the next slide before I get there. So why is the $1.7 billion bond needed? Again, there have been folks, well, we just passed $300 million back in 2020. Why do we need another $1.7? Well, we don't need another $1.7. We need the rest of the $2 billion. $300 million is only 15% of the $2 billion needed. I don't know about you, but I can't run my house on 15% of the budget needs. 15% of my budget needs would not buy my wife another pair of shoes. <laughs> and we're empty nesters. So that's all she spends her money on, shoes. Shoes, no, no, no. That, grandchildren are the fourth priority. Shoes, handbags, hair care products, grandchildren, in that order. <laughs> Is this being recorded? is needed because even in the master plan that was issued in 2019, there was over $800 million in deferred maintenance in our school system. Even if we were just going to address the deferred maintenance, the $300 million wouldn't have got us halfway of that. So that's why the $1.7 is needed so we can get our school district on the right trajectory of where we need to be. If we're going to have or provide 21st century education to our children, we need 21st century facilities. And another thing we just talked about, 
We all know that our superintendent has announced that she's leaving. This is a great recruitment tool for a new superintendent. If we don't pass this bond, who do you think is going to apply to come here? To a district that does not support schools. So we need this bond, if nothing else, to get a, the best of the best in superintendent candidates. We have all these new businesses, Boom and Te Toyota, and all of you have people looking for houses. What's one of the first things people ask you about? The school district. They want, And even before they meet with you, they take a sneak visit, and they ride around and find out what the schools look like. And then they go online. You, you, you all know, people do their research before they call a realtor. And then if they haven't done their research, they want you to do the research for them and provide it. What kind of shape are our schools in? This $1.7 billion is going to help us get on the right path to where we need to be. And oh, by the way, it's not going to happen overnight. This is a 10 to 15 year project. And again, the county commissioners will only issue the bonds when the school district says we have the next project ready, we need bonds. Why is the sales tax needed? Well, obviously, we need revenue to pay the bonds, right? We believe, um, the county manager has, has told us that we believe this increase, the increase alone, will generate between 20 and $25 million a year. He believes that it will take between 40 and $45 million to pay every year annually for the bonds. So this is about, this increase will pay about half of the bond payment. And oh, by the way, we found out through the North Carolina Visitors Bureau that in 2019, Guilford County was the third most visited county in the state. Visitors and commuters spent over $1.6 billion in Guilford County in 2019. That equates to about $4 million just with this quarter cent increase. So what this increase does in the sales tax, it spreads the payment of the bonds beyond property owners to people who don't live in Guilford County but visit and spend money in Guilford County every day. And oh, by the way, thanks to our commissioners, a few weeks ago they passed a resolution that said if the sales tax is passed, then they would reduce property taxes. Yay! But we got to get people to figure, we got to get people to understand that a sales tax spread among everybody is much better than a property tax increase that just affects Guilford County. Right? Um, just looking forward, th this is a highlight, this is an old slide, but these are some of our initial funders to the campaign. These are people who helped fund the campaign and gotten us in a very good place. We're in a very good place. Um, actually, we, we've raised more than we budgeted to run the campaign, and I'm thankful that it will be over on May the 17th. Because both Cecilia and I, when, when Mr. Austin called us and asked us to co-chair another round, we thought the primary was going to be on March the 8th. So with that in mind, Cecilia planned a wedding, I planned a vacation, and a, a non-refundable uh, conference, and, and all kinds of things that we planned in April <laughs> that we had to figure out what's going to happen with the campaign. Well, campaign's still rolling, and we all know that early voting started on April 28th, and we need everybody, we need more people to talk positively about the bond. So what can you do? Obviously, you can vote yes for the bond, and you can vote yes for the sales tax. You can also encourage others within your, you know, whether it's in your personal dealings or without whatever limits you have as a realtor, at least inform them why they should vote yes. Encourage others to vote yes. You can go to our website, smartschoolbond.com. 
and you can sign up. I hope the realtors today, if you, I don't know what the procedure is, but if you can and will, go on our website and endorse the campaign. And we'll add your logo and add the fact that the Greensboro Realtors has endorsed our campaign. Also, you can go to our website and volunteer. We need volunteers. There are 167 polling locations that will be open on May 17th, and we need as many people as possible that have a positive thing to say about the bond to help us on election day to help voters as they show up for voting day. And then um, I have donate to the campaign, but uh, you, you, were, you were one of the last folks we've presented to. Um, now, we, we, you did already. All right. See, Greensboro Realtors have already donated, so you're already good. Okay. Over 30,000. With High Point. It was the mixture of, right? So thank you so very much. Um, so th that's that's my presentation. Vote yes for the bond. Vote yes for the sales tax. And I'm going to allow, Winston was taking notes over there. I'm, I must have missed something. Well, <laughs> you know, you know, John used to call it that act. Um, <laughs> and arguing with that act. couple things. Um, one, I am not running for re-election, so there's none of this that I'm saying to get votes, so I want you to know that. My term ends at the end of December. Um, I want to say just something about GCS to sort of have in your head. You know, Guilford County Schools is the second largest employer in this county. In a place like Louisville, Kentucky, it's the 24th largest employer, and we're actually similarly situated in states and in size of our school district. So, when we think about how we invest in and look at our school system, it's an economic driver, it's a cultural driver, and it's just important for folks to understand that this kind of investment and deployment of resources has a big impact on our community, as if a major employer were investing $2 billion in infrastructure in our community. And so it matters even more here how this can drive our own community's prosperity than how it even drives it in other communities. And it's important we understand how we're different than Wake or Forsyth or um, Charlotte and other communities. This is going to help us get to the place where the school system is not the second largest employer, right? Um, we want it to be lower on the list. We want to continue to attract these big employers that we're attracting. Um, I think the other thing is that this kind of investment is only going to bring us current with other communities. Most people, but you intersect with folks who are from other communities. You intersect with folks who are moving here from places like Louisville, Kentucky, and saying, whoa, these schools don't look anything like the schools in Louisville or in Cleveland or even over in other North Carolina counties because we haven't done that investment here. And so it's important to communicate that sense of excitement, that this brings us current with other communities. It's not we need the little old red schoolhouse that you had when we were growing up and in school. That's not adequate. It doesn't keep us competitive. It really isn't what's contemporary and what's going to lead us forward. You all have a better sense of that than most people just sort of living in the community because you're intersecting with folks from other parts of the country and the state. Um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, why did Frank keep saying conceptual? You guys probably caught that. Realtors catch details, right? Why is he saying conceptual? It might look like, it could look like. So there's a lot of work that have gone into the school designs for the projects that are underway. I mean, architects have been back. It's a reiterative process, as some of you would know, working in the industry where you're building new homes. We have designs. We've got site plans. All of the engineering's been done. But now it has to get costed out. And you know that once you do the costing, that can impact the final design. So we have to keep saying conceptual because, of course, parents and kids and teachers and all kinds of people can get really wed to a picture of something. And then if the costing means we've got to change the design to make the best use of the funds, that's what we'll do. Um, Jody, you know all about that process, don't you? <laughs> you build the dream plans, and then we and in this market, you know what pricing's doing, you know what supply chain is doing. So that's why we're using that word conceptual. It's not that somebody just drew it with a crayon. Like it is an architectural design that's been through a process. Their staff, community members have all been able to input into that process. They've been sent back to the drawing board multiple times to make it better. Um, but now we're in the costing and uh, phase for that. So I want you to understand that. Um, the last thing is, you know, this really isn't a partisan issue. There are, there's certainly opposition. There always is when we're building a ballpark or we're building a performing arts center or we're making an investment. 
Uh, there's always opposition, folks who say we just shouldn't spend any money. But, you know, the bond passed in 2020, one of the most divisive elections we've had in this country, with 73 percent of the vote. And so there were people voting for lots of different candidates who were coming together around this kind of investment. GEA's board is Republican, Democrat, Independent. The bond committee is made up of Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. It was really a, a Republican-heavy group that went in 2020 to the commissioners asking for that $900 million. So this is beyond partisan politics. We want to elevate this. This can be something we unite around in our community, even when other cultural issues are divisive. And so that's been an important part of the way we've communicated this in, um, in, through the bond committee, through GEA, through other organizations that are working on this. Um, I think Skip's done a good job of pulling the commissioners together. The Board of Ed has largely been united around this with disagreement around just pieces of contracts. But this is a uniting issue. And you all are so skilled at how you walk that line of being giving people good advice um, but remaining kind of objective, right? Realtors are so skilled at that. And even if you're not doing this with your clients, people know you as people of influence. You have so much social capital. And I tell people this all the time. You know, the number one reason that people will cite for why they vote for something that they're not really sure about, like, you know, they don't know a lot about judges' races, or they may not know a lot about a, a bond or a ballot initiative. The number one way they make that choice is when somebody they trust gives them a nod says, this is what I'm doing. And they're like, oh, yeah, I trust Wayne Young. I'm going to do what Wayne says. He's smart. He follows. And people know that realtors follow this stuff. They know that you have to be dialed into neighborhoods and to policy and commissioners and, and nuance of contracts so they trust you. So I'm just asking you to leverage that political capital, not in any inappropriate way with your clients, but like with your neighbors and your friends and the folks at church and at Boy Scouts and anywhere. Say, hey, I'm sporting the school bond. Everybody can agree on this. Um, and to the degree that you are comfortable doing that, but you just have a lot of social capital and you can make a difference in this just with that kind of casual endorsement because people, realtors are outgoing, you're used to conversations, people trust you, they know you have details, they know you're following up, and it can have such an influence, you have no idea. Um, we do need help working at the polls on election day and even between now and Saturday. And I mean, I've had a good time. I go out for two hours, I hold a sign, vote for the bond, and almost everybody I encounter is like, I'm for it, I'm with it. Um, turnout has been good. We've had over 10,000 voters vote already. Um, pretty predictable turnout between Democrats and Republicans. Republicans have a history of turning out more on Election Day. Democrats vote more early. The independent vote has been low, probably because it's a primary. Um, but, you know, the so independents sometimes pass on primaries and go just for the general. Um, but independents can choose whether to vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary. They can also choose a nonpartisan ballot in Greensboro, and that means they see only the city council races. They don't have to vote in the contested primaries, um, and they can still vote for the school bond and the sales tax. So even your knowledge about that to friends that say, I don't want to vote, I'm just an independent, go vote for the nonpartisan races. Request a nonpartisan ballot. Vote for the school bond. Vote for the sales tax. These are really important ways that you can help us. Um, these things with, we'll probably have 40,000 voters turn out, um, and in a community like ours, those are literally one, one at a time. A conversation at a time, a postcard mailer, a social me email post. So you can just have a tremendous impact on that, and I just want to ask, encourage, and urge you to use that. With one people, one person, five people, ten people, it will create a ripple effect. A lot of this is just getting people to go vote. Um, the preponderance in voters of Guilford County have proven in past elections that they're for a bond. So it's really just reminding them early voting super easy. There's no lines. There's lots of choices. It matters to vote in this primary because of the school bond. Pumping that sales tax to say that's going to keep those property tax rates low and could lower property taxes, could lower the rate depending on that sales tax passage. You can have a lot of influence on that. So I'm just encouraging you to leverage and use that influence. Um, and thank you so much. The realtors have already provided a lot of financial support, a lot of just energy in the community. I work with a lot of individual realtors who I know. I've seen social media posts. I've seen them out working the polls. So thank you to you and your colleagues for all that you do, really. Um, I used to say all the time, if you want to get something done in Greensboro, call a realtor. I mean, you are a force in this community, and we appreciate you.
Winston just reminded me of one other thing, just, just so everyone is clear. Just because this is on the primary ballot does not mean it will show up again in November. This is our time to pass the bond and the sales tax. It will not reappear like the best candidate that comes in a primary race. So, um, the other thing I forgot is that you all may know this, but the sales tax rate at six and three quarter, you know, 6.75. Wake County at seven and a half percent, Orange County at seven and a half percent, Mecklenburg 7.25, Randolph, Davidson, Rockingham, and Forsyth are all at seven, right? So, all of our neighbors and big counties have done this, they've used this tool to put money into their communities to spend on the things their communities need. And we're falling behind. We're sort of leaving money on the table. We're not being competitive with our neighbors if we don't have this sales tax. And a lot of times folks are like, oh, I didn't realize it's the same as everybody else. So that's important data. So we, we, we lobbied in our group. Invest in GCS. We've been working with the state legislature for months, seems like almost a whole two years, in getting the exception to policy to get this earmarked for schools, and they would not do it. The county commissioners, on the other hand, have passed a resolution that says this money will be used for schools. So we have it etched in quick, quick drying cement, maybe. Putty, putty. Um, so, so we, we do have a, we do have a, a, an assurance from the county commissioners that the sales tax increase will be used for the schools, but we could not get it on actual language on the ballot because the state legislature wouldn't allow it. Anyone else? Question? Yes, ma'am. No, 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 no. What I said was. If the sales tax passes, the county commissioners would decrease property tax. The rate. The rate. That's a definite. They passed a resolution that it will happen provided the sales tax passes. So even if you vote for the sales tax and say, I've done my part, if other people don't, then you get to go with everybody. Three cent per hundred, right? Per, and remember, per hundred per thousand. You all know how taxes per, per work. That's the tax rate. Right. It doesn't mean if your house went from two hundred thousand yeah, to four hundred thousand, yeah, which yeah. we know is happening yeah. across the community, that your actual property taxes won't go up, but the rate, the rate. is either the same or lower. Yes. Yeah, the associations have a policy okay. of broad based taxes. Yeah. And we've supported the sales tax in the past. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Other questions, maybe? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, we do, but it, we can't use it for what we always want to use it for. I'll let, the, well, I'll let the board. Is it about eleven million a year now? It's used currently to pay debt on the previous bonds, but it's only about eleven, about eleven million a year in that comes to Guilford County. Um, and then we've had a longstanding agreement with the commissioners between the board of ed and the commissioners that it would be used to pay down debt on the bond, but it's currently being used to pay down a previous bond. Yeah, but I mean it is true. It, it's true that at the state level, yeah. a lot of lottery dollars were used to supplant funding. So um, they haven't, it hasn't driven out into local communities in total. There's some scholarship dollars that happen at the state level. It's supplanted state funding, and then a portion of it is, goes out to local counties um, to help pay down um, capital needs. As a, as a pastor who tries to help people understand that you know, winning the lottery is a really pipe dream, and they say, well, Pastor, I'm supporting the school. Well, not really. Not really. So um, it's important that we understand that. And I, I think, just me personally, I think it's a little disingenuous to call it the education lottery because people think that all of that revenue is going toward our schools, and it's not. 
Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I just think conversely, I'm yeah. just going to, at the state level, they would say it's going to education, but it doesn't mean it's driving to local communities, that it might be supplanting what they, they might have used other funding before to pay for teacher positions or for raises, and that lottery money is going into those initiatives. But She's it's, elected, I'm not, so. Well, <laughs> I represent a nonpartisan organization, and I'm just trying to, I, I, um, but it's not coming to local communities for that. So, so, so what I've shared with people with that vote no for now, I, you know, if not now, then when? We already have eight hundred million dollars in deferred maintenance. So what I've shared with people is, I believe it's a vote, it's a pay now or pay later proposition. You can either pay now with this sales tax and this bond referendum and make an investment into the future of our children, or we end up with inadequately or undereducated children. Undereducated children become undereducated adults. Undereducated adults become unemployed adults. Unemployed adults become a part of some social support system or the criminal justice system that we all pay for. So you can pay now with this small investment or you can pay later for the life of my life if I'm incarcerated and pay almost $42,000 a year to house an inmate in the state pen. Pay now or pay later. You're going to pay. Yeah, so, I, I, I'll say something this, about yeah. that as well because I think, sure. you know, Take Back Our Schools has been an active mm -hmm. critic of the school system. Um, it's a variety of folks, right? So no organization or movement is defined by one or two people. So there are a variety of individuals connected to Take Back Our Schools, which is driving the No For Now campaign. Um, I think the number one thing on their website says take politics out of education, but I'm going to tell you they're very engaged in politics. Um, and so in some way, and knowing a lot, I know a lot about 501c3 law and 501c4 law. I've spent my whole career working on the right side of those lines, and I think there's places where those lines are being crossed. It may be inexperienced. It may not be nefarious. But I don't know. I also know there's a national movement that's working to leverage and incite you know, local groups about schools because it's this impassioned issue. And we even see other candidates wading into the water. There's some sheriff candidates who said, I'm going to take my campaign to the school board. And we're like, whoa, you know, bring the posse on down to the school board meeting. Why don't you stay in your lane over there as a sheriff? Um, so I think there's a variety of things there. I, I also think you can look back historically and see where there's been opposition to any kind of forward investment, whether it's ballpark, Tanger Center, downtown development, you know, um, and so that's natural that that's going to fuel. Um, you have to pay $20 for their signs. You can get ours for free if you want a yard sign. Um, so, uh, but I think ultimately true that this really is an issue that rises above that. I mean, there are certainly accusations that the school system's wasting money. Very clean audits, rigorous audits, separate reports to the state auditor who's done now two or three reviews of issues and found zero findings at the schools. Um, even with, the other day I was doing math, even with the $300 million of pandemic relief money that came from the federal government, we spend over three years to accelerate learning. Even with that added to our budget, we're spending about 14500 per student. Uh, I mean, you can do the math at the Greensboro Day School. It's up close to $25,000 per student. Minimum security prisons in the state of North Carolina are over $30,000 per inmate. Um, there's simply no evidence to suggest the schools are wasting money or stealing money or misappropriating money. They're doing really miraculous things with that amount of money. And so it's a narrative that works politically. It sows discontent. It sows cynicism. And I'll say from a broad political standpoint, um, there is a strategy to make people cynical about the democratic process because then they don't show up and then folks have a, a smaller number of people they have to influence with their particular position. I happen to be for broad participation, especially in a community like Guilford County that's diverse and where we have had Republican, independent, and Democratic leadership over the years. And something like this, the Master Facilities Plan, was formed in partnership between a Board of Ed and a Republican-majority county commission. It has continued as leadership changed. 
as some of the members of the Board of Ed change. So we have shown where this has broad-based political support and can be a uniting investment effort for our community. And I think if we keep the dialogue at that level and not get drawn down into sort of the dark parts, um, we're on safer ground, really. for growth but you can't anticipate growth so when and and you can't anticipate how many people are going to go to charter schools or private schools either so when you when you build and plan a school you you, you plan it based on the number which is why some of these schools are going to be targeted this is going to be a performing arts school where any child in the district can go to this school there'll be a stem school where any child can go to there'll be a i believe the first i don't know if they've figured it out yet but i believe the first gaming school will be here in Guilford County, where any child will be. So that will help, I believe, with, with, with having a diverse population being able to come to these schools as opposed to neighborhood schools that we used to walk to. But it's the precise advantage of why doing the master facilities plan matters. We've never had one. And that, just doing that, then allowed to build in growth projections and to plan holistically for the whole picture. It's also why you've got to do the full funding. I mean, you know yourselves if you're if you've got a house reno you're doing and um, you say, well, I'm just going to spend twenty thousand. Maybe I'll spend more later. You're going to spend that twenty thousand differently than if you know over the next five years I'm going to spend eighty thousand. So I'm going to build a plan to make the very best use of the dollars that I can. So this this sort of no for now or do a little bit and we'll manage a little bit of time is a horrible use of dollars because it doesn't allow you to cast forward and build to where, you know, what is it, Wayne Gretzky, where the puck's going to be and not where it is now. And so also what Frank is talking about, having a master plan that, that looks at how you use innovation to drive um, interest in schools more than sort of busing or, or too many changing of lines. Other communities have shown you can use this innovative model to drive folks to a school that might be smaller than it was previously because you've got this innovative top-notch programming and a great building. Peck is going to be that way as this expeditionary learning school over in Glenwood on this beautiful piece of property. The VPA school is going to be that way, the gaming and robotics elementary school at Faust, and then the way the CTE programs, career technical ed, are spread across high schools. It's really going to drive people um, outside of just their region. But um, there is growth projected. There's a brand new school being built in Southwest. We'll be seeing some shifting as well. You know, we're going to, I think, see, as you know, some strong growth in the southeastern part of the county now because of the mega site. Um, and there's room out there in some of those schools for growth. Um, so, but it, it, it's, you're right. And one of the problems people get is cutting their nose off to spite their face. They cost engineer themselves out of the future. So you can go to a new community and see a brand new school and see five trailers. And you're like, mm. they're sort of cutting their nose off to spite their face. And we just can't do that. We've got to do the full funding. Yes. just means they might have been using certain tax revenues to fund teaching positions, for example, but are now using lottery funds. And so the tax revenues are going into the surplus or the rainy day fund or to fund economic incentives. Or so, so it didn't necessarily increase education funding the way it might have had it been on top of what previous funding was doing. And I'll just say something else that's come up, which is just a real, you know, it's a, you hear grumbling and then people are like, oh, but they're grumbling, so we shouldn't support the schools. Like something that's currently happening is a shift in 
in um, population and how people are choosing. Across the country, we've seen a decrease in enrollment over the pandemic in public school systems. We are mapping that trend across North Carolina and across the country. The increase in charter enrollment, huge increase in homeschooling. Um, even in national charters, where students can enroll in an online school that's run out of Nebraska, you know, families are making other choices. Um, so for two, w the way that schools are funded from the state is we don't get money, we get positions. So this, we have an allotment funding system in North Carolina, which is very different than other states. So you get X number of teaching positions, X number of principal positions, X number of bus driver positions, X number of counselor positions. And so enrollment goes down and positions get taken away. Now, during the pandemic, the state held districts harmless from that. They just said, we're not going to right size. Well, now the state is right sizing. So enrollment's down by 2,500 kids. So we're losing teachers from the state. Now, the problem with that, as you know, it's not, it may not be nefarious, but 2,500 kids leave across 126 schools. And I, again, I've done the math on this. Even if you skew it towards elementary schools, two thirds of them have probably left elementary. There are more charters in the elementary world than high school. You're losing like three to four kids per grade per school. It doesn't mean they need less teachers. They just have three less kids. I mean, as a principal, you know this, but you're getting two less positions. So then you've got to reconfigure how your grades and your classes are working. It disrupts your school culture to lose two teachers. So there is some grumbling out there, even among parents and schools. Why is my teacher leaving? Nothing's changed. So these changes are happening in our school system. But what we can see is if we look forward, two, four, five, eight years when these schools are up, when you have these new kind of designs, we can teach and manage differently. We can take master teachers and put them in charge of more kids and more teachers. They have sight lines, ways to manage groups, ways to coach other teachers. We've had a teacher shortage growing in this country for a decade. We're not going to solve it in two years. But when we have different kind of school designs, we can both attract and and retain our great teachers and use them differently. But when they're in a building with little classrooms down the row and you can only get 25 or 28 kids in the classroom, that master teacher can't impact 100 kids. But in a different kind of design, just the way people live differently than the way we lived 20 or 30 or 40 years ago in our homes, they can inhabit and operate differently in these schools. So it's gonna make a big difference in how we manage, attract, and retain teachers. Um, that's not necessarily a selling point for the bond, but as you're talking about schools and the exciting things coming into this community, that's something you can be thinking about um, as people are talking about teachers and changes.